the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. In the waters of baptism, John died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. On the day of his baptism, John put on Christ and was clothed with the garment of salvation. On the day of Christ's coming, may John be clothed with glory. Good morning, and welcome to Holy Catholic Catholic Church. I am Father Kevin Gillespie, serving as pastor, and I wish to extend the entire, to the entire family our sincere sympathy, Debbie, and to all of your members of your wonderful family. We gather today to celebrate John's life, and even in our grief, to call to mind the promise of eternal life. As we do so, I hope that all present here will know how welcome you are in this historic church. We extend a special welcome to those of you who come from other faiths or from other Christian denominations. 
as we continue this funeral liturgy, we will now hear the words of remembrance from John's friends and colleagues, beginning with Congressman Fred Upton. We're debating which side we're to be on. John Dingle, man, he was more than just the dean of the house. By any measure, he broke every single record. If he was in sports, his name would be as hallowed as Bo Schembechler, Al Kaline, Tom Brady, Sparky Anderson. And he tweeted about his beloved Tigers and Wolverines until the very end. He was Mr. Michigan. In fact, he forced Denny Hoyer to have a Werner's ice cream float the day before he died <laughs> in a toast. Stenny, I'm surprised you're still with us. <laughs> I treasured our relationship for more than 40 years. Our offices were across the hall, and for years we would stroll together to cast literally thousands of votes. And when you asked him how he was, he had the standard phrase, always better for seeing you. He always said that. The day before he died, we spoke, and I wondered if it in fact would be the last time. I told him that I had finished his book, and had confirmed that he charted a wonderful career, and that it was unfortunate that we never seemed to take time to smell the roses. You know, he was first sworn in as a, the youngest member of the 84th Congress. And he said on the House floor, Mr. Speaker, I am deeply touched by this tribute paid to my beloved father and the respect and affection he was held by all without regard to political creed. If I can be half the man my father was, I shall feel I am a great success. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me assure you that your dad would be awfully proud. In fact, Speaker Boehner designated the Energy and Commerce Full Committee Room as the John D. Dingle Hearing Room forever. When I became chairman, I asked all the previous chairs to have dinner and share their secret sauce of how they got things done. I wanted to learn about their bipartisanship. You see, legislating is not always taught in ninth grade civics. Personalities, friendships, character, hard work, they are needed to master the issues. And one of the savviest former chairs was a guy by the name of Billy Tozan from Louisiana. He always had that Southern Boudreau joke. And one day he made a real rookie mistake. He leaned over to Big John and said, I want to tell you one of my favorite Polish jokes. <laughs> and John said, hold off, young man. I'm Polish. My grandfather's name was Yenglevich. And without missing a beat, Billy said, no problem. I'll start it over, and I'll speak just a little bit slower. <laughs> True story. They were bird hunting friends forever after that. And the Detroit News editor this last week, Nolan fin Finley, wrote, he never wasted a shell. John's focus was to weed out fraud and abuse. And you'll remember that he coined the term about our jurisdiction, if it moves its energy, if it doesn't, it's commerce. We had the world. <laughs> the people who worked with him, his staff and for him, were fiercely loyal. He didn't demand loyalty, but he sure did create it. And I think that's because he could see others as the kind of multifaceted, genuine person that he was. He didn't look at someone and just think, oh, they're a Republican. Nope. That didn't stop engaging him from communicating. 
He'd say so-and-so, well, they're from out west, and that district has this spectacular trout or bass fishing hole. He could talk to you about health care, environmental regulation, any other aspect of Congress's work, but he could also talk to you about the ballet and the theater, military and political history, hunting, fishing, life in general. And I can't tell you the number of times that he connected members and staff who were going through some very difficult issues. He possessed a real kindness and wisdom, and he shared it where he thought that it could make a difference. Bipartisanship, he wrote the book, he really did. He nudged us all to work together. I can remember when we first started working on the auto rescue plan. We knew that it had to be bipartisan, and we had to have both John McCain and Barack Obama on board before the November election. And without that legislation, we knew that you could turn the lights out in Michigan, the auto state, for good. No one was more special in his life than the lovely Deborah, that is for sure. Their wedding vows nearly 40 years ago kept him who he was, kept him alive. That love was terrific. And we've all seen her continue the legacy of a dingle representing Southeast Michigan for some 86 years. It's not easy. You know, when you read his book, you can hear that booming voice. And like any good movie or book, it's got a last chapter and a last scene. The end for him was often, I love you, blessings always. Some 25 years ago, I went to his district to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the polio vaccine with Dr. Salk. And I flew into that old Detroit airport and who was waiting for me at gate G57? About as far to the curb as it was from Kalamazoo to Ann Arbor. <laughs> it was John Dingle, bad hip and all. Now, he's waiting for us at another gate to visit again. God bless you. Debbie, beautiful, sweet Debbie. Good morning, my beloved brothers and sisters. John would like for us to say good morning. <laughs> Today, on this day, we mourn the passing of a giant. It was not just a man, but some high, some high, and some way, John Dingle stood ahead of all of us, broad shoulders, tall, and determined. He was a man people admired. We admired him. We loved him. He taught us, he led the way, he got in the way. And from time to time, he got us in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Before John Dingle used what he had, he had the power of the people vested in his very being, in his very soul, he inspired each and every one of us to be brave, to be bold, to stand up, to speak up, and to speak out. He loved the people of his district. 
and the people loved him. He loved the citizens of our nation. It was not for him, his election, a road to the Senate or the White House. It was not the gateway to riches after he left the hill. For John Dingle, public service was a mission in and on itself. It was a great honor to see him, to speak to him, to say, how are you doing, Mr. Chairman? He said, don't call me Mr. Chairman, call me John. It was very hard for me to say John Dingle. My friend, John Chairman Dingle, was bold, he was brave. The success of 59 years sounds so easy when we list all of his accomplishments. But he was human, he struggled, he experienced challenges. About 10 years into his career, President Lyndon Johnson sent the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to the floor of the House. The issue of race was at the forefront of the nation. After the historic march on Washington in 1963, Dr. King spoke about the dream of a true democracy. And I demanded on behalf of the young people, wake up, America, wake up. I didn't know any better. I had all of my hair, a few pounds lighter, and much younger. John voted for the bill as an act of conscience. He believed it was the right thing to do, but he was facing a very, very tough re-election. The issue of race was dividing our country, and the Michigan State House slated him for destruction by cutting a large population of African American out of his district. He was facing a Polish-American, like himself, who had voted against the bill. John did not run from his decision or try to explain away his vote. He stood on the courage of his conviction and won that primary by 5,000 votes. People respect you when you stand up of what you believe. They may not always like what you decide, but they know they can trust you to do what you believe is right. And that counts for a great deal in the minds of the people who supported John Dinger. John Dinger, this man, this brave, bold man, loved the people, and the people loved him back. I remember one occasion traveling to his district the people showed him so much love and so much respect. He defended them like they were members of his own family. And they trusted him with their lives for 59 years. John was a good and noble man. The most important lesson John can teach us is that the passion and power of love never failed. Technology would change and pass away. Ambition would spark like a flash in a pan, but grow into a bonfire that consumes all it touches. Even knowledge one day would cease. But John knew that love is everlasting. He loved the house. He loved America. He loved his family. We can learn from the love and the compassion of John Dinkin. He realized that our work as members of Congress is not a job. It is a calling. He knew that government is what we make it. Government is you, and government is me, answering the call to represent the will of the people. It is the mandate to use our power, not to advance our own ambition, 
but to serve. My beloved brothers and sisters, let me say again to his sweet Debbie, thank you for holding up and standing by our friend, a great man, our brother, John Dingo. If you need us in the hours to come, the days to come, call us, and we will be there. And let me say again to my friend, to brother, John Dingo, I want to thank you for all of your help through the years, for all of your love and support. Thank you for your friendship. I will miss you. We will miss you. But I do believe deeply in my heart that we will see you in the morning. We have come together today as fellow Americans to celebrate uh, the life of one of the greats. Debbie, thank you for giving me the honor of uh, being part of this today. It means a lot to me to, uh, to be here to honor my friend, the gentleman from Michigan, the dean of the house, the chairman. And as you know, uh, John was driven uh, by the notion that congressional service is an act of uh, coming together and finding common ground necessary uh, to advance the interests of our country. Uh, a mentor to many of us who served with him in the Congress, uh, John was revered by colleagues, Democrat and Republican alike. In 2013, uh, when I was Speaker, John became the longest serving member in the history of the House, and we honored him with a ceremony in Statuary Hall. Uh, we surprised him, as Fred pointed out earlier, uh, by announcing uh, that the room of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, the chamber uh, that uh, had already become synonymous, synonymous with his name, would henceforth be named the John David Dingle Jr. Room. Now, this idea didn't come from John. It didn't come from uh, his fellow Democrats. Uh, it came from two Republicans, the current chairman of the committee and the former chairman of the committee. And like many uh, who served with him, they loved him. Uh, and that's not to say that uh, uh, my friend John was all honey and no vinegar. <laughs> he was a practitioner of what you might call tough love. <laughs> he was a man who fought fiercely for what he believed. As a young man, it meant uh, enlisting in the United States Army in the Second World War. As a member of Congress, it often meant uh, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the opposite political party. On occasion, it meant going toe-to-toe -to -toe with his own political party. And sometimes, when necessary, it meant getting in the faces of his own friends. I can't tell you how many times over the 25 years we served together, he chastised me about smoking. But you always knew where you stood with Mr. Dingle. I remember when I became uh, chairman of the Education and Workforce Committee in 2001. The first thing I did after I got elected was to find John in his usual place on the House floor and sat down and said, what do I do now? Uh, but he was always there, always there with advice. And if you go back and look at some of the speeches that John gave during his final years in Congress, a few themes came up repeatedly. Uh, time and again, he spoke of uh, goodness, of kindness, of decency, of friendship. And by the time uh, his career of public service had reached its apex, uh, there were the, these were the things that John had come to value above all else and to embody in his own life. Uh, he was fond of the notion that uh, we as Americans are all in the same boat together. Uh, at the helm of uh, the ship of state, Democrats rode left. Republicans rode right. John Dingell rode where the people of his beloved Michigan district wanted him to row. 
And with those priorities always in mind, he forged a legislative record uh, during his decades in Congress that may never be matched. Health care, the environment, energy, civil rights, uh, many of the most significant laws of our land forged over the past 60 years bear the unmistakable imprint of John David Dingell, Jr. His record also includes uh, helping to stop what would have been some very big mistakes. Now, the rough and tumble of the legislative process can test the patience of even the most disciplined soul. And John Dingell was not a man given to illusions or prone uh, to reliance on sugar-coated antidotes. And the United States Congress, he knew, uh, has never been a perfect institution. What it has been, at its finest moments, is an instrument furthering the quest for a more perfect union, a quest that began more than 200 years ago. John Dingell was present for more of those moments than any other American ever to serve. Through his honor will, his commitment to the dignity of his fellow man, and his skill as a legislator, uh, he was also the driving force behind many of those movements. He was a great legislator, not just because he was a shrewd negotiator or a master tactician or a hard-driving son of a gun. He was all of those things. Uh, but John Dingell was a great legislator, and above all else because he was a great American. One who believed in, in his, with all of his soul in the greatness that the idea uh, that is America. Our nation is blessed to have been served for so long and by such distinction as John Dingell, Jr. I'm blessed to have known him, blessed uh, to have learned from him, a truly a man of the house. Rest in well-earned peace, my friend. Judge Dingell, John the Third, Jennifer, Gabriel, Romy, Robin, Jim, Jewel. It is hard at this point in time, after three extraordinary speakers, not to be redundant. And I'm sure I will be. John Dingell was known by all of you here. There's nothing, therefore, that I can tell you about Jing, Don, John Dingell that you don't already know. We know, of course, John Dingell, like all of us, was not perfect. None of us are. But we know how very, very good he was. We know that is, what, that is why he kept getting reelected to Congress more than any person in the history of our country. Elected to do the people's work in the people's house. And what an extraordinary record he achieved in the almost 60 years he served. John Dingell made a profound difference on behalf of millions of his fellow citizens and indeed people around the world. He was fair-minded, but as has been said and all of you know, he was tough, very tough. Many have known his fierce and biting judgment. Many, too, will recall, as has been said, his gentle soul. He was intolerant of evil, intolerant of injustice, intolerant of malfeasance, 
and incompetence and made sure everyone knew it. At the same time, he was an advocate and fighter for tolerance. Jim Clyburn, you know that. Like all of you, I saw his great strength, his patriotism, and his extraordinary, extraordinary adoration of the lovely Deborah. Like you, I saw him as a man of both complexity and, yes, simplicity. A man who served so well his country, his family, his state, his community, the House of Representatives, and we, his colleagues. That's how all of us knew John Dinkle. When I first arrived in Congress, John had already been there for over a quarter of a century. And I had the privilege of serving with him for 33 years. Like many of the freshmen at the time, I saw him as larger than life. He was imposing. Yes, intimidating. He was, as John Lewis has said, chairman John Dingle. Seemingly unapproachable. At the time, it made me think of an old country ballad sung by Tennessee Ernie Ford. It told of a giant of a man who held up the buckling timber in a collapsing mine, allowing all others in that mine to escape. Big John, that miner was called. John Dingle was to us freshmen our very own Big John, a larger-than-life figure who had raised up the institution of the House as a legislator and as a leader in our party. As the years passed and I got to know John the man, not only as Big John the chairman, and as it turned out, he was approachable. Who knew? He was, I discovered, as so many of you did, as tender as he was tenacious. And he became a dear, dear friend. Thank you, Debbie, for allowing me to say a few words. I never stopped looking up to him as a senior colleague. Even as he became my dear friend, he continued to be Big John to all of us with whom he served. And Big John was a master of the house, as has been said. On occasion, he would unabashedly use his power as a chairman to cut through the confusion on an issue and impose his will when he believed it to be morally correct thing to do. <laughs> he once gaveled a committee meeting to a German right before he was about to lose the vote, declaring, you may have the votes, but I've got the gavel. <laughs> and more often than not, he ultimately got the votes too. John liked and respected every member with whom he served for having been elected by their neighbors to represent them in the Congress. That is at least, until they gave John a reason not to. He never minced words. He never held back. Sincere, earnest, determined, courageous, persuasive, principled, indefatigable, at times acerbic, say amen, The voices you just heard are those who knew that personally. <laughs> and so many times, of course, gentle and encouraging. The love he showed those of us who were his colleagues was often tough love, 
He loved us sometimes with soft words and sometimes with sharp elbows. Democrats and Fred, as you pointed out, Republicans alike. John handed out barbs as often as he handed out punchki. Those are Polish donuts. If I mispronounced it, I apologize. <laughs> and how fortunate we were to have both. From the biting letters he wrote to his uh, pointed questioning of witnesses, from his unyielding advocacy for legislation ahead of its time, to his tweets so undeniably of their time. Deep inside the man, we found an immeasurable determination to make the House of Representatives, his state of Michigan, and his beloved America a better place. He used his time in the office to do exactly that. John fundamentally understood what the House of Representatives can be when it's at its best. He saw it as an engine by which representatives can transform love of country into the tools of justice and security and opportunity for the people we serve. We all know the tools he helped fashion, health care reform, Medicare, the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Endangered Species Act, civil rights, voting rights, support for all working families, and in particular, of course, Michigan's auto workers, whom he loved and who loved him. His respect and admiration for working people were manifested in his dedication to the men and women who build our cars and to the United States auto workers. He was their steadfast champion, and in doing so, championing the hopes and dreams of every working American. The list of legislation shaped by his hand stretches as long as his unrivaled tenure. Early last week, he called and said that John wasn't doing so well. So I got on a plane last Wednesday and flew to Michigan. Debbie greeted me at the door in Dearborn. She, of course, was the love of John's life. Their love, of, their love affair was an example of devotion and support. John told everyone, each of us, I'm sure, that Deborah, the lovely Deborah, her first name is lovely. The lovely Deborah was his strength, his steady hand, and his most important advisor and closest friend. And oh, how justifiably proud he was that she was continuing the legendary Dingle service in the Congress of the United States. I spent two and a half hours with John that late afternoon. John brought low by age and illness, was still the lion-hearted center of energy and outrage about the wrongs that he saw. His sense of humor still intact, his concern for the House and for our country was as fervent as ever. We've talked for an hour about what was, what had been, and what should be. He had a deep concern for the future of our country, we which he expressed in his last words for America. In it, he wrote this, as I prepare to leave this all behind, I now leave you in control of the greatest nation of mankind and pray God gives you the wisdom to understand the responsibility you'll hold in your hands. A little later, Sandy Levin joined John and me, as well as Debbie and John Orlando, one of his closest friends. 
Sandy and John reminisced about so many of the crusades pursued by the Dingle and Levin families and their allies. I was amazed at the sharpness of his memory. Sandy's brother, Senator Carl Levin, observed in 2005 that, and I quote, the story of John Dingle is the story of the hopes and dreams of the American people of the last 50 years. And my church would say amen again. <laughs> John Dingle indeed was a dreamer. And thankfully for us, he was also a doer. Before I left, I kissed him on the forehead and told him, I love you, John. And I knew I spoke for all of his colleagues as well. He knew the end was nearing. I don't know that any of us knew it was 24 hours less. But even at the threshold of death, he was in command. He was concerned. He was ready for the next day, the next tweet, the next fight. As Debbie said, he was classic John Dingle. And that is how I will always remember him, our dear, and loyal friend, a great American, a great member of the House, and a very good and decent man. God speed, Big John. John's family, thank you for loving him. Deborah, thank you for giving Hillary and me the chance to be here to honor someone we loved and admired and would happily follow. Thank you for going to Congress. and continuing the service of a great name in a new era. Thanks for making the last 40 years good for him. And you kept him from being hidebound. I watched him change and grow to the very end. I want to thank John's staff, supporters, colleagues from over all the decades who are here today, who in different ways made his work possible, many of whom honor his legacy through your own service. Madam Speaker, Majority Leader Hoyer, Speaker Boehner, Congressman Lewis, Congressman Upton, and all the serving members who are here. What do you say, don't you think we owe it to John? Let's be honest. One of the reasons none of us would have missed this is this is the only time in our entire lives in public service that we were in the same room with John Dingell and got the last word. <laughs> Don't you dare jump up and say that. <laughs> the, uh, the 
This service has been very moving to me. Many of us had the chance to talk to John. I, we probably talked, I don't know, just a little over 24 hours before he passed away. And I was so grateful that his mind was clear and his spirit was strong and his determination was, he said, you know, I'm not done yet. And he didn't know if he was gonna live an hour or a week or whatever. The idea was, <laughs> you ride the horse till the race is over. And all of us, particularly those of us who are not young, I hope we will remember that. He was, A remarkable man, as all of you have said. A patriot in some cases without peer in the history of America. He spent more time in the Congress trying to fulfill the Founders' admonition to form a more perfect union than anyone else. But He didn't just spend time there. One of the things that I was always amazed is he managed to find a way to have a good time. Hillary and I, and like many of you, we can remember almost every time we'd ever been with him and every casual conversation we had. I treasure those things. I've been in a duck blind with him when it was so cold, the ducks wouldn't come out. <laughs> and I told him he should look on the bright side. It saved us from a lot of criticism from the animal rights people. <laughs> I have been in his district campaigning for him and one of the rare examples when it looked like he might get less than 100% of the vote. I sat in the rotunda in the Capitol when he was honored by breaking the longest service record. Many of you have commented on how being his friend entitled getting your hide ripped off from time to time. You have to understand that's in part the mark of an honest friendship. If you think your friend is wrong, you tell him. And both of us have experienced this exquisite example of affection. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. He never snuck around behind your back. He didn't say one thing to your face and then call somebody to get a little press to do something else. John Dingle was a stand-up guy. He got up, he suited up, he played the game straight ahead. He was an old-fashioned man who did things in an old-fashioned way that we should adapt for new times. He fought like crazy, but he always asked himself at the end, okay, I'm not in the majority, or I am in the majority. Now what are we gonna do? The thing I loved most about him was that he was a world-class doer. He understood that the trust he was given as a member of Congress representing his people was first and foremost a job. And the job required him to show up and do something for which he could give an accounting to the people who hired him and say, we did this, this, and this. We tried this, this, and this. I failed, so we did this, because this was still possible. He loved politics, but he also understood that not everyone would, dis would agree with him, and if you believe in the Constitution of the United States, that that was a good thing. It would give us 
a better, stronger country as long as we continue to see each other first as people. People first. And then figure out what we could do. I, I don't know if all of you have read his memoirs, but it, it's funny. He was so busy doing things, he didn't have time to write his memoirs till he was over 90. They were just published last December. And I was uh, looking through it again last night, and I thought, you know, he was afraid he was running out of time, so we sort of short-circuited the last 25 years of his life. He had so much to talk about. But there's one passage that sums up the book in a nutshell. And uh, out of deference to our presence in this historic holy place, and with all the clergy here, I think I will have to paraphrase some of the more <laughs> colorful language. He, he wrote, I served in the house for 59 years and 21 days. It remains the record for continuous service in the United States Congress, something that seems to impress a lot of people. I am not one of them. <laughs> Quite frankly, I don't care about records. Any fool can sit in the chair and take up space. <laughs> it is what... <laughs> it is what you do with your time that matters. I look out over this crowd and I see so many of you that I had the honor to serve with. Members of both parties, I can tell you things we did together. John Dingell was just about the best doer in the history of American public life. Since 1955, that's a long time ago, until he left, he had a hand in just about every important contribution to following our <coughs> that followed our founders' admonition to form a more perfect union. And he was good about doing this when he was in the minority as well as when he was in the majority. I remember I, was, I pulled out the notes to make sure I, my memory was right. And it was, I, in 1996, the Telecommunications Act was the first bill ever signed in the Library of Congress because we thought we were writing a positive communications manifesto the next several years. It was a highly complicated bill. The communications law had not been overhauled in 60 years. And John and many of our Democrats wanted to make sure that there was ample room for competition to keep the rates as low as possible and the service as wide as possible. And uh, he worked with Chairman Bliley, and he spoke that day in the Library of Congress as the minority leader of that committee because he was interested in getting something done. His long loyalty to health care is legendary, but in the end, what counts even more than his honoring his father was that he was there for Medicare and Medicaid. He was there for the Children's Health Insurance Program. He was there for the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things that I especially appreciated was his saying that his favorite job in public service was his summer job between his junior and senior year in college as a park ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park. For 59 years, he worked to be sure future generations could enjoy America's national treasure. As far as I know, he supported the efforts of every administration, Democrat and Republican, legislative or executive, to preserve that land. 
And then he became obsessed with public health. He supported President Nixon in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Health and Safety Agency. He supported the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. I want to just say a couple of things about his record on civil rights. It is true that he endangered his seat in Congress by voting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His Polish immigrant Catholic heritage, his study of social justice with the Jesuits up the street, did not permit him to pull up the ladder of opportunity just because he had climbed it. And he was doing this a long time before the Civil Rights Bill was voted for. In his first term in Congress in 1956, he sponsored an anti-lynching bill, a fair housing bill, and a bill to eliminate the poll tax. As someone who grew up in a state where the poll tax was used to control the black vote, it meant a lot to me. But he became a particular hero of mine when I was only about 13 years old. In 1959, young Congressman Dingell stood before the fearsome speaker, Sam Rayburn, and objected to what is normally routine, the seating of all the new members at the same time. Because one of them was a congressman from my native state, Arkansas, who had defeated the sitting member for supporting the integration of Little Rock Central High School. And he beat him on a write-in campaign in which people were allowed to put printed stickers on the ballot even though the law didn't provide for it. There were other interesting irregularities. <laughs> but the idea, it sounds simple, a little procedural bill, but I think it's very important, especially to the younger people here who may think of John Dinkle as yesterday's man. He was not afraid as a young man to risk the ire of the people who could have wrecked his effectiveness to make the point that no one should gain automatic admission to the House if elected under a system that was not genuinely democratic. Finally, In 1961, I told Congressman Lewis this, John Dingell accepted uh, an invitation to go to the Union Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, to speak to the NAACP. It's a pretty good gig for a Polish kid from Michigan. <laughs> and the lady who was doing the dinner was trying to do a favor for a young lawyer she thought needed some help because he was making only $35 a week at the time, which wasn't much money even in 1961. So she let this young lawyer introduce John Dingle. And Vernon Jordan did a very good job of it. <laughs> and he called to tell me that to this very day, he was just another one of John's kids that his career really took off after he got to <laughs> introduce John Dingle. Until his last day on earth, John Dingell was doing. When his body wouldn't work anymore and his mind wouldn't stop, he turned to America's national obsession, tweeting, <laughs> and became a Zen master. 
You should read, if you haven't, the collection of John's greatest Twitter hits. I mean, it's Zen mastery. Few words, much wisdom. And if you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. He honored the people who sent him to Congress for 59 years by keeping the sacred pact of doing and doing and doing. We give thanks for his long good life, but the real thing we have to do is to honor it now as he charged us in his last letter. He often quoted what I used to joke was his good friend, Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> who said after, after the Constitutional Convention, when asked what we had been left, he said, a republic if you can keep it. So now, he has done all he could help us keep it. And the greatest honor we could ever give him is to spend whatever years we have left at the wheel to the last day. Goodbye, John. Finally, you are in that place of more perfect union where all God's children know how it feels to be free. Thank you. My friends, you've been sitting for a long time. Let's take a moment now to stand and pray. Oh God, your nature is always to forgive and to show mercy. We humbly implore you for your servant, John, whom you have called to journey to you. And since he hoped and believed in you, grant that he may be led to our true homeland to delight in its everlasting joys. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated again. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. There's an appointed time for everything, and a time for every affair under the heavens, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the plant, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter the stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to be far from the embraces. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. God has made everything appropriate to its time. 
but has put the timeliness to their, into their hearts so they, can, so they cannot find out from beginning to end the work which God has done. The word of the Lord. response can be found in your program. and kindness follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come the A reading of, from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to address the people in these words. In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, 
in every nation, who, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of us all. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him and all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. With you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Jesus began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> Uh, when I was uh, a young man, certainly uh, by the time I got to high school, um, I was very interested in things uh, having to do with law and politics. My father was a lawyer, and it weighed into where I went to college. And so I went to Claremont Men's College in Southern California. When I arrived at the house eight years ago, it was David Dreyer, a co-alumnus of mine from Claremont, 
who was happy to see me uh, and uh, welcomed me here. Uh, at Claremont, we learned uh, more than we would ever have learned in ninth grade civics to love and to respect the institutions of government and law in this country. And um, so at Claremont, uh, it was my plan to go on uh, to law school, become a lawyer, eventually uh, to enter politics and replace either Warren Magnuson or Scoop Jackson. <laughs> but then I went to Gonzaga Law School in Spokane, Washington, and I ran in to the Jesuits, uh, and I put on the last suit I would ever wear and became a man in black. Fast forward to eight years ago, I had put my imaginings and my hopes of law and politics behind me, done a number of ministries. I was teaching ninth graders out in Portland, Oregon, and my superior asked me to uh, apply for a position that was opening up. I did. Uh, and I was interviewed by John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi. I didn't blow the inter, uh, interview. And I became the chaplain of the House of Representatives. God had remembered my bucket list. <laughs> so I was in the candy store. Uh, I was like, I came to an institution that I knew and I loved from my studies, uh, I observed from afar, um, uh, well prepared to come having been uh, teaching and coaching 14 year olds. and naturally found my way uh, to the revered elders of the house, who, who welcomed me in a way that other members didn't. Uh, notable among them, Dale Kildee, who is here with us today, uh, Jim Sensen Brenner, graciously the first to come to my office to welcome me. Uh, certainly Walter Jones, God bless him now. We would all be in North Carolina, were we not here. And John. I never met John. I never knew John as Big John, as the chairman. My, my predecessor said to me, just call everybody by their first name. Don't deal in titles. Don't deal in, because you're not playing the politics here. You're. <laughs> you are ministering to John. You're ministering to Nancy, you're ministering to Patrick, you're ministering to Ben Ray. You're ministering to brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I came to know John. And John, uh, over the years, was always happy to sit, uh, see me, as it was mentioned. He sat in his little perch there in the second row on the Democratic side, along with Dale Kil Kildee. They look like um, uh, Waldorf and Astor, the two old Muppets, you know, that, was <laughs> that sat there and commented on everything and la 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 you know. <laughs> And then uh, when he retired, uh, went back to Detroit, and in those times when he'd come back to the Hill, God bless John, he, he would call me up and want to see me. I said, <laughs> of course, John. Uh, and so I would come over to Debbie's office and, and we would sit, sit down, and his, his first question was, so the most important thing I, I need to know, Father, is are you doing well? and uh, always was. And we would get to talking as uh, men who talk seriously do. Um, 
And he would always ask me, he said, Father, at the end of all this, do you think God can forgive me? John, uh, if God cannot forgive us, we are all doomed. God's mercy is greater than God's judgment, but I don't, I don't think you need to worry. He says, what a, Father, am I all right with the Lord? Do you think I'm all right with the Lord? Now, all the readings of uh, the Mass today, uh, each one uh, takes, uh, in the Catholic Church, hopefully about an eight-minute homily. Uh, if we were in Steny's church, I'd go 45 on each one of them. <laughs> but I'm, I choose to focus on, uh, on the Gospel, on the Beatitudes. Now, for those who are not familiar, our uh, non-Christian brothers and sisters, uh, I am so honored that you are here uh, gracing us with your presence here today. Uh, and, and, and for uh, those of us who are Catholic and don't know the Scripture very well, um, <laughs> this is the fifth chapter of Matthew. Well, guess what happens in the fourth chapter? Fourth chapter. It's, it's Jesus' temptation in the desert. And one of the temptations that Satan places before Jesus, I'll give you all the power uh, uh, in, the, in this world. I'll give you all the power in this world should you worship me. And, and, and Jesus says, you know, we worship only the Lord our God, and there shall be no God before him. So Jesus offered power said, that's not the will of the Father for my mission in life, for my vocation in this life is not that power. It is, I don't have power. I will hold power for the mission. Someone said that as a member of Congress, nobody in government hold, has power, they hold power uh, for the people they serve. As a matter of fact, John, that was you that said that. That's what Jesus was saying. So the first thing Jesus does after he's been tempted by Satan, he comes out and does he exercise power? No, he comes out with, blessed are the poor in spirit. What? Not a power move. Blessed are the meek. It's not power politics. This is something else. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments being brought into a new understanding. Of, this is the way, if you are to follow God's will, this is the way to be. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of God is theirs. John, are you right with the Lord? You were never poor. John was not poor. Most of us are not poor. So what does it mean, the poor in spirit? It means, I think it means, for those who are holding power to identify with those who have no power. That would be the poor. So you're not actually poor, but you get it. You're the poor in spirit. And John, you got that. You understood why you held the power of the people. It must have been a great consolation for John, as it was for many of us, when Pope Francis came to the floor of the house and reminded us that the, that the vocation of a politician, the vocation of politics, is a call from God. It is a holy and sacred trust because the purpose of politics is the common good. This is what 
God calls all of us to, and certainly those who hold power for the people that they serve. Father, am, am I all right with the Lord? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Civil rights. It was mentioned before where John stood on these things, what John was willing to do. John, did you hunger and thirst for righteousness? And did you do everything you could? Blessed are the merciful. How many fellow Americans, how many people in our world feel the oppression of a merciless economy, a merciless politics, a merciless society? who feel the oppression of a whole world that has no mercy, that is merciless in beating them down. John, you were part of that system and you showed mercy. You were merciful to so many. Blessed are the merciful John, for they shall be shown mercy. My brothers and sisters who serve now, you are called to serve by your people, but in a profound sense, by a God who loves all God's children. John, you seemed to have understood that. In your life, you chose a vocation, you followed a vocation, understanding full well that the power at your disposal was not yours. It was held by you to serve your brothers and sisters, which you did as a man poor in spirit, who hungered and thirsted for justice, and who showed mercy. At the Last Supper, there was a young man named John who reclined at table and lay in the bosom of Jesus. John. As an old man now, you are born to new life. You are the young John at the eternal banquet. Recline now in the bosom of your Lord Jesus. Please stand. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in him, we join our prayers now. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For John, that God will reward him with peace and joy for the good he did. During his life, we pray to the Lord. Lord For our nation, may God grant us wisdom to pursue justice and freedom for all people, especially the marginalized and the powerless. We pray to the Lord. Lord 
for all of us assembled here to worship in faith that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord for all young people full of idealism and energy, that they might find focus and meaning in gospel values, the values of the Beatitudes, to build into their lives, we pray to the Lord. Lord. And for Walter Jones, who today is being commended to the Lord in North Carolina, that God will reward him with peace and joy for the good he did during his life, we pray to the Lord. Lord our God, hear the prayers of your people. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Seven hundred and thirty five, number seven three five. My friends, let us pray that our offering be acceptable to God the Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and glory of God's name for our good, the good of all the Holy Church. Look favorably on our offerings, O Lord, so that your departed servant John may be taken up into glory with your Son in whose great mystery of love we are all united through Christ our Lord. Please remain standing or seated as you are able during the Eucharistic prayer. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful people, Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for us in heaven. And so, with all the angels, archangels, the thrones and dominions, all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the ancient hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. source of all holiness make holy therefore these gifts by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall that they might become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion he took bread giving thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat this is my body which will be given up for you. In the similar way, when the supper was ended, he took the cup, once more giving thanks and praise. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer your Father in thanksgiving this life-giving bread and this saving cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence to serve you. We humbly pray that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we might be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, remember your church spread throughout all the world, Help her to grow in love together with Papa Francisco, the College of Bishops, with the clergy, and all, all your holy people of God. Remember your servant, John, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he, who was united with your son in death, a death like his, may also be one with him in his re resurrection. And remember also all our brothers and sisters, ancestors of all, who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your presence, and have mercy on us, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, 
all the apostles, martyrs, and saints, all who have done your will throughout the ages, we might be co-heirs to eternal life to praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. and sisters, let us pray together to the Father for the coming of the kingdom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day that by the help of your mercy we might be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your people, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Take a moment to offer peace to those nearby. Brothers and sisters, behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and happy are we called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy.
My friend, for this time of communion, you are all invited to come forward. If you are coming forward to receive communion, we will know that if you put your hands out to receive the body of Christ and then the cup, the blood of Christ. If you're coming just for a blessing, we will know that if you place your hand over your heart. All are invited to come forward. In your hymnal, number 35, 35.
32, number 93. 